Okay, patient preparation. So, um, before we even start, before I even go out and get a patient, the first thing I want to do is just make sure that an actual physician ordered an actual CT scan on this person, right? It seems kind of like a no-brainer, um, but a lot of what we want... I've been at some facilities where we were so busy that there was one tech who just was... Like one of the senior techs was given time just to do this because... Some people will order some real wackadoodle stuff, and it's like, we do, wait, hold the phone. We do not need to be doing, like, double contrast CT of the admin pelvis on the 16-year-old girl. Like, she clearly needs an ultrasound, right? Um, and so there's an opportunity here in this initial part to really kind of test your knowledge of why we do different things, kind of differential diagnoses, and then also to make sure that you've, you're taking an opportunity, if necessary, to educate that physician. A lot of times, I'm not going to be the person educating the physician. I will call the radiologist. I'll say, he ordered this, this, and this on this patient. Please call him up and, and tell his ass off, right? Or whatever the radiologist needs to do um, to make sure that doesn't happen again. You'll start to get familiar with different clinicians' names and stuff, and, and it'll become clear who needs some further education and how to go about that. Some doctors are open to a technologist calling them up and saying, hey, um, did you really mean like a chest or like an angio chest on this chest CT? Um, other physicians, they want, you know, there's that whole medical hierarchy garbage. I guess this is going on YouTube. Um, so the proper selection of a protocol is the responsibility really of the radiologist, right? So, um, uh, Coven was asking about how do protocols work, where do protocols come from? Really good question. Um, a lot of times program, protocols are already preloaded into the CT machine, right? There are days, bad days, when I have been known to say, you could train a monkey to do my job, right? Because a lot of what I'm doing is just putting people on a table, pushing a button and go, right? But between the pushing, and but, pushing a button and go, the, the computer's telling the scanner to do a whole lot of stuff. I need to be well versed on all that whole lot of stuff that the that the machine has been told to do, right? And so there's a lot of different ways that this can be maintained. Um, I worked at a very large with a very large radiologist group in Austin, and they actually had a radiologist again who was just dedicated to prescribing protocols for all their different CT scanners, because they had everything from like a two row GE CT scanner to like a 128 row Siemens. And each one of those machines needed particular protocols written for it. So that radiologist's job was just to sit around and tweak protocols all day long. We all hated that person because they were constantly sending us protocol updates. And it would be like in a PDF file. We'd come through the PDF file and see, oh my gosh, they changed this one again. And we'd have to go back and upda upload, change that in the CT scanner. Right? But a lot of times it's a preset fixed thing in the CT scanner and I don't want to go messing around with those numbers too much unless I really know what I'm doing. By the time we're through with this class, we should have some understanding of like the broad idea of how to mess with those numbers. But in all honesty, it is so dependent on the manufacturer of that CT scanner, it won't be until you're in a workplace for two or three years you've really had a chance to get accustomed to GE and how you do GE or Siemens or Hitachi or whatever that you can actually mess with that. But basically, you want to make sure that you have a protocol that's going to answer the question that's being asked with a minimal dose to the patient, right? Minimal risk to the patient. Um, and some places, like <clears throat> in different states, like in New York, it's actually, I don't even initiate the injection. They have a nurse load the contrast, initiate the contrast injection. I am solely responsible for the CT scan that results from that contrast injection. Every other place I've worked, I initiate the injection, um, I pull the contrast, I do all those kind of nurse type things, and then I also do the scan. Um, some places they want the radiologist to look at every request for a CT scan. Oh, this kind of goes without saying. Make sure your rooms are clean. A lot of the stuff that we talked about last week, like people puking on us, barfing blood, um, uh, in enema tips flying across the room, all that kind of stuff, we got to put the kibosh on. Like, in the, the way you do that is just prep the hell out of your room to where it's ready for whatever crazy zombie attack might happen, right? 
Um, I've got my linen, I've got my emesis, I've got all my gloves, I've got extra gloves, I've got stuff to clean up radio pharmaceuticals, I've got stuff to clean up blood, I've got stuff to clean up barf, I've got everything right there within, within a hand reach, and I can just be doing that. Um, okay, um, it's really important to get a uh, medical history, and so that's what we'll spend some time mocking today is like, how patients give history, how we receive history, um, and how best to ensure patient safety. We'll be talking about this even more when we get into contrast next week, okay? Um, different ways that we have to make sure we're safely doing the procedure that we're doing, right? Um, sometimes a patient will be like, no, it's actually my abdomen that's hurting, not my chest, right? I have to reason through that with that patient. Okay, well, is the patient... It, are they giving me the appropriate history? Do I need to call the physician? Maybe we're trying to rule out... Um, a, maybe they say, I don't have any pain at all. But then I see on the doctor's order, triple A, which means abdominal aortic aneurysm. Okay, I don't need to be doing a routine CT of this person's abdomen. I need to be doing a CT angiogram of this person's abdomen. Right? So I'm constantly... I'm never sure that I'm doing the right thing on this patient until I sit down, I've got them all wired up, hooked up, and I'm about to hit go on the contrast injector and the scanner. At that point, I'm 110% certain that I'm doing what I need to be doing. But every point up to that, I'm not sure. Maybe we don't need to be doing a CT today, right? Um, I think there can be a lot said for shipping patients to other places. Um, CT has grown really, really rapidly. Our textbook mentions that. But the concerns related to the radiation exposure are legit, y'all. Like, the CTA of the neck probably causes cancer, right? Probably. Like, it causes da enough damage to T-cell lymphocytes to contribute to cancer in some form. So we are using quite a bit of radiation for these exams. I am never sure if this is the right exam until I'm, I'm locked in, I'm ready to go. Up until that point, I'm going to be checking the patient, getting history, talking to the physician if need be, making sure we're doing the right thing. You want to get at least two forms of verification for ID. I think we're all pretty good about doing that. Um, safe administration, testing my IV site. I'm going to hook up a saline syringe and push it as hard as I can um, into their IV, right? Why am I doing that? Well, that's how quickly I need to flush contrast through that IV, right? I want to make sure that not only is this thing safe and secure and ready to go, it can push, it can take a really serious push, right? The CT power injector is, it's got pressure limits that are well above, like, for example, the pressure in your car tire. Pressure in your car tire is like 30 PSI, right? That's what keeps your car going down the road. I might be hitting 200 PSI on my power injector, right? If you can imagine, you know that sound that it makes when you push down on, the, on your tire and all the air flow, flies out? That's air flying out, right? Not contrast. Contrast is, the, is borderline heavy metal, iodine, right? Very viscous, and I'm pushing it really hard through a very tiny, tiny bore of an of a intravenous catheter. So I want to make sure that thing can take some pressure. Um, and that it's secure, it's locked in place. Also, one thing... When, it, when our patients bring their arms up for like a CT of their chest, I, what did I just do right here if I've got an IV in the antecubital? I just kinked it off, right? Another thing, older people, when, when they bring their arm up really high, they got bursitis or whatever, I might kink something up here. I was telling some of the students the other day, I had a patient was doing a CT of her chest. All the contrast went in really smooth. I come to review the images. There's no contrast, in this person's chest, this old lady's chest. Where's the contrast? I go and I check the IV. It's fine. The IV is fine. It's all up here. She has a huge, she has 100 milliliters of contrast in her shoulder. How did that happen, right? She kinked the vein up here. She brought her arm up and she kinked the vein, right? Blew out the vein up here. All the contrast is up here. She might. I mean, honestly, I, I don't know if she was ever able to use that shoulder again. Right? So, um, learn from my mistakes if you can. Um, and be aware of, of how 
the Venus system works, right? All of it's kind of continuous. And then, of course, pregnancy status of women. Uh, if y'all want, I can show you uh, accidental pictures of babies and stuff from the CT room. It's not fun uh, for anyone when you scan through a person's abdomen and there's a baby there um, that shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Um, so it's always better to be safe than sorry if you're dealing with, uh, frankly, any female from what, what now, like the age of 9 to the age of 59 something, if, if I ask an old lady if there's any possibility she, she, she could be pregnant, she can take that as a compliment, right? Um, it's, that's pretty much my job is, hi, my name is Ben, are you pregnant? Um, <laughs> so they understand that, I understand that. Um, in addition to this pregnancy status of a woman, I'm also interested, are you lactating? Are you, are you, are you nursing right now? Because if so, the iodine that I'm going to give you is going to show up in your breast milk, Right? So we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Okay. In terms of protocol selection, um, it's largely, as I mentioned, guided by a whole lot of considerations beyond me. But I need to know what that protocol is and how it works. Um, and, and, and typically when I'm inputting the protocol, there's going to be an opportunity for me to type in some history. Use that opportunity because it's a lot more easy to type it in there than on the back end. Um, so the stuff that's important is the symptoms that we're looking at, whether it's acute or chronic, any previous studies. Please refer, please, like especially if we're dealing with radiation therapy patients, um, prior from, and give them the date and where it was done, right? They need to be checking that prior, because that's what they're measuring, is what did the cancer look like now, what does it look like then, right? And they're just, um, all this stuff is really, really helpful, too. So as we go through the form, you'll see there's a place for past surgeries, there's a place for significant medical issues, the current symptoms. Um, patients just, for some reason, breeze right by the question that says, have you had any surgeries? Um, so if you see nothing there, or if it seems like a really small list, um, it's helpful to help them reconstruct their history a little bit. Have you ever had a surgery, any kind of surgery? Um, when was it? People will tell you that they had a surgery, but for some reason, I think because surgery is traumatic, we don't remember when it was, right? Um, like I, one time, I injured my uh, uh, antecubital ligament, with AC, I had an AC tear, right, up here. Um, so that's, what is that? A chromioclavicular tear, right? I don't remember when that was. It's 2000 something, like 2001 or 2000, I don't remember. Why don't I remember? We tend to forget that stuff. So help them try to reconstruct it. Take some time. It's helpful. It's important to know in addition to the current symptoms. Lab values, these are really critical, right? If I've got a person who's totally comatose, um, had a seizure, whatever, they're non-responsive, this is the next thing that I'm looking at. What's their lab values? Patient non-responsive, patient unable to listen to breathing instructions, right? We call that stuff CYA history. Right? Why is this? Why is this person breathing on the CTA of their chest? Well, non-responsive, unable to listen to breathing instructions. Right? Um, this is not. No longer are we talking CYA. Like this is like you do this on every single person. If you don't do this, like you fail. Right? You failed CT. Um, BUN is critical, but um, creatinine is much more critical. We are, depending on our institution, we will be looking at a creatinine range or we will be calculating a GFR, what they call an eGFR, from the creatinine. Either way you slice it, you need a creatinine. Some places, their protocols, and I think this is changing for Baptist because the ACR just released their white papers. We'll look at that related to contrast. Um, so there are some changes and they're recommending the eGFR because it's just, it's a more exhaustive number. Not only does it consider the patient's creatinine level, it considers their age and their gender and their ethnicity, which are all factors in what their kidney function is doing. Why are we interested in their kidney function? Can anyone tell me? You have to be able to flush out the um, Yeah. This stuff is really sticky. If, you, if I had a bottle of it and I poured it on that desk, it'd be just like if I poured a Coke on that desk. It's going to get really sticky, right? So if you can imagine, I'm flushing that stuff through a person's uh, vascular system. The kidneys are going to be primarily responsible for picking it up and excreting it. 
they need to be working well, right? If they're not working well, I can still inject if the patient's on dialysis. There's got to be some way to get this junk out of there. Because if it just stays in their blood system and just circulates, um, it can cause some real problems, right? With a healthy patient with a normal creatinine, which I would say is more on the lower side of these numbers, I've never um, injected on a, on a patient of 1.7. I've, ne I've never been in a facility that said that's a healthy creatinine. Um, I, uh, the max at most places without doctor's permission is like 1.2 or 1.3, right? Um, but if I inject on a person who's got normal healthy creatinine, um, there's still, there still is some concern there. I still need to be telling them, drink a lot of water. Get this stuff flushed out of you. It doesn't need to be sitting around. Don't go home and drink a six-pack of beer, please because that's just going to dehydrate you. Don't go to Starbucks and get a coffee. When I say water, I mean water. And get pretty serious with them about it, because you need to flush this stuff out, right? Ditto with the barium, right? But it's not working on quite the same level. All right. Um, if we're doing any kind of CT procedure, like an um, interventional abscess drain or um, anything that requires big needles and uh, weird-looking people, to run labs. There's no lab people in here, so I can talk about lab people. Um, we need a PTT, um, a PT, PTT, and a platelet count. Why do we need that stuff? It tells you how fast the blood clots. Right. So if I'm going to stick a needle in someone, I want to make sure they can heal up. The last thing I want to do is stick a needle in someone and they just bleed all over my table. Right? I want to keep my room looking nice and pretty. Um, so this stuff will let me know how quickly things are clotting, and there's some normal ranges for platelets uh, for a healthy person. If we're dealing with uh, cancers, we sometimes might see a low platelet count. Um, yeah. So if we're, doing, if we're doing anything in addition to a normal CT scan, we'll ask for these labs in addition. Okay. Um, Patients should be told, okay, this is how this thing works. You're going to lay on this table, you're going to move through the donut. You're going to get a warm feeling, you're going to feel like you wet your pants, and then we're done. Right? Um, that's exact, basically how the procedure is carried out. It's going to take me about 10, 15 minutes. I'll say, even though I can do it in about 5 minutes, I'll say 15 minutes, because then when I'm done in 7 minutes, they'll say, man, you're fast. Right? Um, if they look, if I walk out, and they're Mr. Joker guy, like, hey, Mr. CT, man, I'm so funny. I will tell them, hey, guess what? Your exam's going to take 45 minutes because you're a pain in my butt already. <laughs> um, so gauge, you'll learn to gauge approximately what exam time is going to be helpful to tell someone. But you gauge it in your favor, right? Um, whether or not we're going to be doing contrast. We are going to be doing contrast today. We're not going to be going to doing contrast today. Um, contrast is just help, st stuff that helps us see your insides more clearly. Um, and what I need from the patient, I need you to really hold still. Hold still, hold still, hold still. Let me know if anything's hurting. Let me know if all of a sudden you can't breathe, but otherwise hold still, right? Um, and, how, and then, of course, as soon as they get off the table, they're going to want to know what happens next, right? We'll have results in 30 minutes. We'll have results tomorrow, right? Um, if I'm not really fast, if I'm not really busy, I might allow them, if they're interested. When I worked at the cancer treatment place, we did this a lot. I would allow them to look at the images with me. I would say, we've got some time. If you want, I can show you the pictures. I'm not a doctor, but we can look at the pictures together. Um, let them know if they need a CD. And I, I found most patients do not know whether or not they need a CD, right? If you're dealing with a cancer patient, they need a CD. Go ahead and make them a CD. If you're dealing with a teenager who hit his head when he was playing hockey, he probably doesn't need a CD, right? Okay. Informed consent. Um, the very first thing is whether or not this patient is competent to sign the consent form. Is there a DNR? And for an inpatient, I need to be looking and seeing who has durable power of attorney, all that kind of stuff. Um, so is this person in a frame of mind where they can give, they can legally give me their consent for this procedure, right? Um, so, I think that's, that's significant. 
What does informed consent mean? It means that I've explained to them how this procedure works in a term that they can understand, and they understand that they've been given me an opportunity to ask questions. If I'm doing an interventional procedure, they've had an, an, an additional time to talk to the radiologist, and at that point they've given us their consent. And I need a signature. I don't say we, I don't use the word immobilization, I use the word support. Um, I don't immobilize people. I support them so that they can get through the procedure, right? That support might be me with, a, with them in like a headlock, you know, as I drag them in to do a CT of their head. But I'm going to support them in some way that's best for where they're at. Um, uh, if a person, if I roll into an ER room and they are already immobilized or they're in some way restrained, um, then I will, you know, I'll talk to the nurse a little bit about how the restraints work and stuff like that. If you're dealing with a patient who's in handcuffs or whatever, generally there's a nice friendly person in the Kevlar vest who comes with them, right? Uh, all right. Okay. Um, I'm constantly assessing my patient, especially as I'm injecting contrast. Um, that's the real risky, weird moment um, when, you know, kind of hush goes over all over the world and you're wondering, is this person going to have a reaction or are they going to be okay? So looking at things like how are they breathing? Did they just puke all over everything? Um, I had one guy, he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I did a CT scan a whole lot. He had anxiety so bad that he would vomit every time we gave him the contrast. I had to do his scans every three months, you know, um, just because of the course of the treatment that he was on. And so it just got to where I always knew if he was coming, I would do the injection, he would puke, and then I would do the scan, right? Um, it's not, that's not really a reaction. That I think that was just related to he, how keyed up he was, right? Um, any kind of special monitoring device, fine to take him in on a patient, I think getting a blood pressure is really helpful, um, so it's helpful to have those devices close by. Um, so body temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure are all helpful. I used to get um, flack at one place that I worked at because I would get a blood pressure on just about everyone I did a CT on, um, with some exceptions, until like there were two or three people, I realized this person does not need a CT scan at all, they need something else, like they've got a blood pressure that's so low um, that that's what's going on. The reason you're dizzy and you can't see crap is because you don't, you've don't. you got no blood running through your, your, your brain right now. Um, so you don't need a CT of your head. You need um, the beta blocker or something. I don't know. Um, so the body temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, it, uh, you get to where you can start to assess people and see where they're at in terms of, um, in terms of their vital signs. Yeah. Going back to that, is, hot blood is hypertension or hypotension a contraindication for contrast anyways, just because it is so thick? I'm not. I mean, typically if they've got a really high blood pressure, like a, a, a really bad high blood pressure, they're going to be taking care of that before they order a CT scan. Um, but, yeah, if you're going over to the ER and the person has a really high blood pressure, I would communicate with the nurse and the doctor and say, hey, is it okay for us to go ahead and go over to CT, do, or do we want to see? Because they'll give some medicines that re act real, real quickly and, and cause the blood pressure to go down. Is the hypotension okay, though? The hypotension, um, again, a lot of times a CT scan might be contraindicated if, like, for instance, CT of the head, the person's dizzy all the time, blurry vision, that's your blood pressure. It has nothing to do with your brain, right? So I've had two or three patients who wind up, we didn't do the CT of their brain. They just had no blood pressure. For whatever reason, the ordering physician neglected to take their blood pressure or review it. Um, so it's not necessarily a contraindication for anything that we would do in CT, um, but it may give an answer where the CT is not going to add any additional information. Does that make sense? Yes, cool. Other questions about blood pressure stuff? These are good questions. Blood pressure is a, a big deal. Um, so, uh, so here's some normal ranges for body temperature, especially if you don't want to get some kind of weird tropical fever. Um, pulse, where I can feel a pulse on a patient. If um, 
if I've had to call a, a code on a person, generally the first thing I'm going to do is throw a, a blood pressure cuff on them and start feeling for a pulse on the other side, right? So knowing my pulse points, like, um, is really, really important, okay? Here's some normal beats per minute, and you don't have to count the full 60 seconds. You can just have your watch out there for 30 seconds and multiply it by two, right? Um, if you got a more athletic person, uh, their heart rate might be a little slower just because it's so powerful and awesome, right? If you have a fat slob like me, then, you know, you've got... My heart has to work harder, I guess. Uh, respirations. Um, again, watch the person for 30 seconds and multiply by two. Um, really good nurses can do that while they're getting a pulse. It's kind of amazing. I don't have that skill. I have to get their pulse with the first 30 seconds and then get the respirations with the other 30 seconds. Um, otherwise, they're gonna, the numbers are all going to be screwy. Blood pressure. Um, so systolic is the peak pressure, diastolic is the base pressure, and the way that you can measure that with um, a blood pressure cuff and a, and a what is this, sphygmomometer, what is, it? is that, is that? Yes, okay. Is you, um, you crank the thing up to at least like 120, 130 pressure on their arm, right? You slowly let it off while you're listening for it, you'll hear a whoosh sound, right? And that's going to be your systolic pressure, when that whoosh fades off, that's your diastolic, right? Um, okay. But most of us are using robots for that now. Um, I don't trust the robots all the time. Sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. Um, the nice thing about the robot is you can hook it up before I even do my injection. I can get a, a blood pressure before I do an injection, and I can actually do my scout scan while I'm getting my blood pressure, right? So before I even start the injector... I can know, okay, this is what the person's blood pressure was prior to injection, right? If something happens post-injection, then I know prior this is what it was. Now we've got something going on, right? The person's in shock or whatever. And we'll see that blood pressure start to fall off. Um, so, uh, yeah, and this is pretty straightforward stuff.